welcome to Pause for Payments. I'm Christy Duncan, and I have with me here today, Pete Falk, a former CEO, now doing leadership and mentoring based in London. Penny is an insightful and successful leadership coach, and she works with women leaders all around the world and at all stages of their careers. Welcome, Penny. Great to be here, Christy. Today, we're going to talk about reputation building and visibility for women leaders. This is a particularly vital topic for all of us, given this extraordinary pandemic situation, when we're all in lockdown mode and not easily able to build visibility. But Penny's going to share her insights to, with us here today. And really, I'm really looking forward to the discussion, Penny. So let's start. One of the topics that you focus on in your leadership coaching is reputation. And I love this. It's so important for all of us in our careers. Can you share with us your insights on how women can work to build their reputations, especially given that gender can play such a big part in how we are perceived in our workplace? Sure. Well, Christy, I think reputation is one of those things in our career that sometimes we take for granted and yet it's probably our most powerful career capital. So what interests me is the things that all leaders and women leaders in particular can do with intention around our leadership aspirations and our leadership ambitions. So reputation is it's just the story people tell about you. It's the emotional wake you leave behind you in the organization. So it's really interesting sometimes to just stop and say, well, what is their story? What is the story people tell about me? And what, is, what do I want people to be saying about me? And is there a gap? So why would we let, you know, given our reputation will get us our next job before we're even thinking about it. And so it's what we do, it's how people experience us, it's what we stand for. It's not some little you know, thing we can put on a laminated card and show people, it's people's experience of us. And so we need to be working on that as leaders to ensure not so it's fake, but to do it with intention because our reputation, as I said before, will be um, what gets us our next job. And that is very linked, as you said, to visibility raising, because what people say about us is really important for us to know. As I say, it's the wake that we leave. And what people say about us informs our visibility and definitely informs our progression. That's so interesting. I love the way you describe it as a wake. So what kind of happens after you leave the room or how people mm. speak about us when we're not in the room. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the, the more senior we become, it's like a bigger boat, the bigger the bow, the bigger the wake. <laughs> and so we have to take responsibility for the emotional wake we leave. Not only do we do it with intention, but uh, sometimes as leaders and as aspiring leaders, we don't realize the wake that we leave when we leave, the, you know, when we leave a room. So it's taking responsibility for that as well as being intentional about our reputation. That's interesting. Can you give us some examples on that? Well, in some of, with some of the women I work with, um, they, let's take one thing. I work with a lot of women who are very perfectionistic. So they have one of their career uh, success, what's worked really well for them is to be really, really good. You know, we know that the bar is set higher for a lot of women, that a lot of women feel like imposters. So one of the things we do often to compensate is to over deliver. And all of us, so perfectionism is that one thing that you think, ah, oh, this is in my talk. This makes me feel confident. But, you know, what's it like to work for a perfectionist? We all have. So, you know, it's like, okay, now let's flip that around. What's the wake I leave by being so demanding, by setting such a high bar, by going in, you know, something, you know, would, wouldn't, what would good enough look like? And what would it give the people on my team in terms of their motivation to make it happen as opposed to being Mrs. Redpen? So, you know, it's, it's like really understanding the things that, especially what, in terms of what got us here as leaders won't usually get us there. So we've got to look at all of the things that 
worked really well for us, like our perfectionism, our over-reliance on our technical competence, um, our, our being really helpful to everyone around and go, okay, to get to the next stage of my progression, what will serve me well? And one of the first things I think to really look at is look through the window of your team and your peers' experience of you. That's what I mean about reputation. And go, gosh, you know, I mean, I've worked for a perfectionist. It was really uncomfortable. And so why would I want to put anyone through that? That's what I mean around, that's an aspect of your emotional wake. Wow, that's so interesting. So this is putting things into really concrete context. Thank you for that. I see, Penny, that you also coach women on their visibility. Mm. And visibility can mean many things to many people, especially, you know, in the, in the not so visible world that's kind of in lockdown and only visible on Zoom calls per se. Can you share some strategies that people in our audience, women in particular, might consider to build their visibility in their jobs? Yeah. And I guess I would preface it, Christy, with I often find, you know, a, a big statement, and this has been, you know, the research around this is compelling, that visibility is the most important factor for progression. Let's just put that to bed now. <laughs> we got to, again, it's like what got you here might not get you there. And I find a lot of women really push back at that because you hear, well, my work should speak for itself. Um, why should it's all political and it's all grubby and why should I have to work on my visibility why can't I just be doing my day job better and better and I absolutely understand that but visibility is this complex mix of perceived skills technical skills for sure but also leadership skills it also means access to stretch assignments it means being liked and rated by senior influential people in the business. And if you don't achieve that, then your progression will have a lid on it. So there's something about reframing your visibility, not as something that's tacky and self-serving, but that's something that will ensure that your leadership aspirations will be able to really get traction. And yet you're not leaving all of this leadership capability on the table. Now, you know, we've got examples. I've heard many a chief exec who will have women leaders at their table who, who come with their idea that they're there as a technical expert. That gives them confidence. But what they're leaving on the table is anyone observing their leadership potential. Because there's an element, we have to have technical competence, but we also, people are looking all the time, we're always scanning. You know, are you asking strategic questions or are you waiting to be the technical expert? Whereupon you will be sitting in that technical expert box and that's fine, but someone is always looking for, uh, what are the other leadership capabilities? Stepping in, confidence is a leadership capability as well as competence. And so women have that, that uh, challenge, that balancing act. Um, they're looking for whether you are able to ask why questions. So if you're looking at visibility raising as something that's tacky, put that to bed. It's really important for you and for your team because your teams expect you to be able to do that, just like they expect you to be politically savvy. So just be intentional about it. What is the plan? And some of the things that are really important for visibility raising is what you volunteer for. And we know that often women volunteer for all of the social club, thing, all of the things that we're expected to volunteer for, but be really intentional and deliberate about volunteering for a high, high visibility strategic project. Mm -hmm. um, how you are at meetings is really important to be intentional about, am I bringing my most strategic leadership self to this? Um, Sponsors, mentors, really important for visibility. Networking, <laughs> that whole chestnut, really important for visibility. And how we talk about not only our own accomplishments, but others' accomplishments. And in the virtual world, sometimes it can be very easy for us to just become, again, focused on task. And we fall into one meeting after another after another are really important to say, what are the two meetings that are very important for me to be working on my visibility? Who have I reached out to? 
uh, even informally to learn something from? You know, have I got my virtual mentors uh, in place? Is there someone who I can learn from? So rather than just become task focused, remember that when you were walking the floor and looking who could, you could learn from, that we need to bring that into our virtual world and be really deliberate about building our visibility and you know, asking for you know seeing an opportunity there's a there's a program a project going on well you know i would like to bring my marketing expertise to that 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 human capital project who might i know who might go yeah i think penny should join that what can i learn and then how could people observe what i could bring to it so again intentional often sounds uh you know tacky to a lot of women uh, but be, it's really important that we do that because just like your reputation is an important part of your career capital, absolutely visibility is the most important fact, fact, factor for advancement. So if you're interested in progression, you need to work on your visibility. These are all really, really great insights, Penny, and I love the way that you frame them. They're so helpful for us when we... Um, go through our careers and there are things that I wish that I knew early on. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I think my career could have looked very, very different had mm. I um, done much more on my visibility and cared perhaps more about my reputation, thought about it more and been more intentional on it. I'd like to switch gears now and speak about what you call a gendered voice. Mm. Can you talk about this gendered voice and tell our audience how we can manage our voice to our advantage in our careers? Sure. Um, just like with uh, visibility, and this isn't about uh, making women into victims. The fact is that our socialization, th these have been millennia in the making, these stereotypes. And one big stereotype is that leadership is an agentic masculine thing. And so that women move into leadership, sometimes they can get pushed back or backlash or even feel uncomfortable in it because they need to demonstrate what we call agency, you know, ambition and confidence and competence and, and certainty. But at the same time as women, they have to, without getting pushed back, demonstrate warmth, friendliness, approachability. So women, uh, have a tight rope to walk and a trade-off to make that male leaders don't need to make. Now, that doesn't make us victims. Yep, is life fair? No. What that means is that, you know, in the next few generations, until it becomes more natural for women to be leaders, we need to be really skillful. We need to know how to, to do that tight rope, walk that tightrope with integrity and being authentic. This is not about teaching women to be men. And also if we get stuck and thinking, well, it's not fair, you know, that kind of victim mentality just sucks the life out of us. So it's like, how do I be creative? How do I be skillful? Because I owe it to my goddaughters and granddaughters and their daughters so that they'll be looking around in a couple of generations time going, well, what's your problem? Which is probably what they see now. They say now, but you know, so that tension around women in leadership disappears. So we're the ones at the front end. So that's why we need to be skillful. So what do I mean about gendered voice? Um, generally, boys, it's a bit like the visibility raising. Boys are rewarded still if they kind of talk up their achievements. Still on the school ground, you know, right now. Um, and they talk about their achievements. And girls are rewarded if they play down or play down their superiority. And if they talk up still, you know, it's very subtle. Girls will get a little bit of hmm, pushback, you know, and then when women bring that into the workplace. So, you know, I've had so many people, chief execs go, oh, I had no idea she wanted to do that job. Why didn't she tell me? Well, yes, there is that. You need to be able to ask. But often when women do step up, you know, ambitious woman and ambitious man have a very different tone to them. I've never heard a man described as having sharp elbows. You know, so there's this tension between, is it okay? So what we learn as women uh, with these ritual elements to our speaking, which is softening language, and that's fine. But again, there are status implications around that. So if we're at a meeting, for example, what we do observe is that very often women will do a lot more apologizing 
and in their emails, more apologizing, being indirect. So we'll wrap a criticism in either a compliment or something. So again, we soften. We're expected to soften and we learn to soften. Um, over explaining and using the we voice instead of I voice. Uh, and so what this means is that people are picking up signals about our seniority and our leadership gravitas. So let's, so, you know, what do we do about that to be skillful? Because we don't want to be just, you know, jerks going around, well, I did this, I did that, because you'll get, you'll get pushback around that too. The women will be penalized if it looks like they are, uh, you know, advocating too much for themselves. But if they don't, people go, well, why didn't you tell me you wanted that job? So we don't believe in double binds because that just takes, sucks all the energy out of our ability. It's like, well, how do we become skillful at this? So we need to be, uh, manage that competence like ability thing. So how do we do that? Apologizing, for example. First of all, we need to listen to ourselves. We need to become really aware so we can become skillful. You know, our self-awareness just is there to inform our self-management. So if we do a lot of apology, just go back and go, gosh, I always use the we, use the we voice. That's very appropriate. But when you're in a, um, a performance review, you might want to sprinkle a few eyes in there because otherwise people can't hear that you were central to that. And they don't mean to, they, you just haven't told them, they don't hear it. Apologizing is really interesting and women do a lot of that. And at some stage, um, a boss of mine early in my career said, oh, you must never apologize. You know, it's just really bad for your authority. And I was kind of take no notice of that, or <laughs> to be fair, not an awful lot of other things that he said. But, you know, I would say apologizing is so powerful when a leader does it for good reason. So don't waste it by sprinkling it through, diminishing your authority, making it look like you are, uh, are diminishing your capability. Use it for when you have to front up to somebody and apologize, when you have to apologize for, to your team for doing something that is gonna hurt them, apologize for something that you should have spotted. That is a powerful apology. You waste the impact of your apology if it's sprinkled through to just soften. And it doesn't mean to say we don't apologize, but just, you know, if you think of the difference between, again, this is being intentional, sorry I'm late when you walk into a meeting versus thanks for waiting. Now there is an authority to the later one. You're still apologizing, but it's not quite the same. Um, instead of, oh gosh, it's not really what I would have done if I'd had more time, as opposed to I'm proud of what we've done given the time we had. And I can't, it's kind of subtle, but these, because these are rituals, these are habits, these are vocal habits we get into, for us to really land as authoritative leaders, we need to become skillful with our language. Wow, this is all great. This is definitely going to be one of these discussions that I'm going to go back and replay and take better <laughs> notes. <laughs> Time and again, thank you for sharing these insights penny they're all really bang on and i and I, they really resonate with me and i'm sure they will with our audience i have another question that uh, i've seen you discuss in some of your materials and that is about networking and you talk about networking as a great way to build reputation and visibility can you share your thoughts about how and why we should network yeah I mean, networking, you know, mostly when people think of the word networking, you know, our stomachs kind of sink and we think, oh gosh, I know that's something I need to do more of. Or we have visions of standing around with a warm glass of bad wine with aching feet thinking, God, I need to get home, put the kids to bed, how much longer, you know, do I have any cards to send? You know, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, the reality is though, networking in terms of our progression needs to be part of the day job. We need a breadth and diversity of inputs to fuel our career. And so we need to be, sorry to bang on about it again, we need to be deliberate and intentional about it because it won't happen unless we do. So it needs to be part of our strategy. And so again, the reason why you would do this, sometimes when we go on oh, networking, it's again, it's tacky. You know, why should I have to do that? It's all you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And actually it's not, when I looked back, and looked at what networking, and I should have been much more intentional about it, what it gave me. It gave me things like 
avoiding groupthink. It gave me career opportunities, sure, but it gave me the opportunity to be the bridge amongst other people who wouldn't otherwise connect. Um, it helped me break, you know, get breakthrough ideas. People who weren't weren't like me at all. Uh, it helped me really work collaboratively, collaboratively, um, and also it helped me give give other people a hand up. And so it's not about you scratch your back. You go into networking as if you are there to help somebody. Um, one of the big things for me uh, when I was very nervous about going into a room is I changed the channel. I remember just looking at, it was a huge room, mostly men, you know, grumbling, low gray suits, thinking, God. And I looked around and I saw a guy standing in the corner looking terrified. And I thought to myself, if this was my home, I would never let that person stand in the corner of my home. And so I just flipped. I'm the host. I'm the host here. And I grew. I felt confident. And I went over and spoke to him as someone who wanted him to be comfortable in my presence. And doing so made me feel comfortable. So there's something about how do we go into these situations with a fresh mindset about you know, sometimes the stakes aren't really that high. Go into networking, saying, what am I going to bring to this? Not go into it about what am I going to take out of this? Because for most of us, that feels transactional, feels transactional. Um, I love the work. If anyone's interested in doing any reading around uh, networking, that Professor Herminia Ibarra at London Business School uh, does around networking and she talks about there being three levels of network which is really helpful to have because I think it's really important that you and in these virtual days even more important that we audit our network and there's three elements there's our uh, operational network this is how we get stuff done at work oh you know Jane and Jack and he'll help me with this that and the other that's our operational network there's our personal network which is kind of what I call our tribe these are the people who get me who I can download to who have a good laugh with who will you know be a good sounding board be a good thinking partner and the third one and that's usually the weakest for many of the women I work with is our strategic network and these are the people who see us out there in the future these are the people that will fuel our vision for our future. So have a little look because there are traps sometimes in our network. And your network is, how do you order it, audit it? Go back six months and say, who are the people I've spoken to in the last three to four months? That's your network. If you haven't spoken to them in six months, do not consider them your network. The nature of relationships is they atrophy. Personal, professional relationships atrophy unless we do something with them. And so we need to be able to keep in touch. Uh, so have an audit of that. Look out for what are, you know, the birds of a feather. Because, you know, likes attract principle, well established in social science. We, you know, and that means that we, you know, birds of a feather, we like to be with people. And that means it's often harder for women to find common ground. So we just might have to work harder at finding common ground that isn't naturally seen there. So uh, networking has to be part of the day job. Consider it having a breadth and diversity to fuel your career and make sure you do that audit and that your operational, personal and strategic network are as strong as one another and pay attention to it every couple of months. Who, am I need to, who do I need to reach out to? And that's just as possible to be doing in a virtual world, even though I know how often it just is so tempting to fall from one meeting to another. Wow, this is all really fascinating. And networking is something that I have worked on very, very hard the last few years, especially building women in payments. And I yeah. have said many times that your network is your single biggest career asset. Yeah. So I like the way that you, um, that you stratify it into three different types or levels of network, different approaches, reasons why we have networks mm. and being intentional about it. And Yes, indeed. It's, you know, it's one thing to say I've got a network of whatever, five or 10,000 people on, on LinkedIn, but 
how can you actually maintain that network if you're trying to contact them at least once or twice a year? Yeah. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. And those relationships are how you will become known. And, you know, they, they thrive. They thrive on contact and they thrive on your being able to really understand what it is that they need. But again, as you say, let's be deliberate and intentional about it because as you have demonstrated, Christy, it's a huge career asset. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you for your insights, Penny. I have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. And you've had this absolutely stellar career of former big tech CEO, now owner of a successful global coaching company, uh, and leadership business. Can you share some of your own pearls of career wisdom, as they call them, with our global audience of women in the payments and fintech industry? Wow. Well, very, very generous of you to say, uh, you know, I have a stellar career. I had an interesting career uh, and one I'm really both proud of and excited to have uh, walked through. And I guess that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now, Christy, is that I, you know, I, I took some strange turns. In terms of careers, though, the, the challenge is that there are no straight lines in life. And if we look at our careers in a linear way, like this year, we're likely to get hijacked. So, you know, a couple of things I would say to park immediately, if this is something that gets in your way, is to is social comparisons. You know, people go, well, I gotta be in lockstep with this person and I haven't got that there and I should have been v VP by now. And that takes up so much energy because also it gives us a false compass. And the real opportunity that I have found when I go back and go, a lot of what I did was not intentional. I was crashing around in the, into the furniture in the dark. And I sure wish I'd someone like me that it could at least turn the light on and say, did you really want that chair there? So the, the thing is that it's understanding our why. Start with that. What is the purpose of my leadership? Because we know anyone will put up with any what if they know why. So really, if you know, what are you doing here? So again, take some time to do that. What is the point? What's the point of my leadership? What's the legacy I want to leave? And when we know that, that is our compass. Because, you know, I had a map for a while, but you know, I might, you might be able to read a map and then we do this and then you go here and then we've got this trajectory. A map is no use to you without a compass. So your leadership purpose is the compass. Okay, whatever happens in life and my personal life, my professional life, I've got something here that will keep me true. And then when we know that sometimes opportunities come to us that because we haven't been looking in our side mirrors and our rear view mirror, we're blind to them. We're blind to thinking, God, yeah, this could be the thing for me. We're so busy on our linear path. So from my experience is, is find your why. Why am I here? That will enable you to fuel your courage to do things that are outside your comfort zone. Um, and it will also enable you to look through opportunities as a filter and go, you know, I don't think that's really for me. God, the money's great and it's this and it's that. But it's not about my not being ambitious or not confident enough. It's because I know I'm not gonna be my best leadership self in that environment or working for that person or working in this sector. So I think the why thing, um, and again, the network it sounds tacky. Most of my biggest supporters have been, and allies have been men in my life. Thank them, really be clear, ask people for feedback. We also do know that women don't get, all minorities get less feedback. It's called protective hesitancy. So sometimes we're not getting the feedback we want. Uh, so ask people, uh, build trusted relationships, really be generous with how you talk about other women's achievements. So make it normal. If you're leading a team 
and you've got some women on it because women will often get pushed back when they talk about their achievements. We need to normalize this really fast because if they don't talk about their achievements then no one knows what they've achieved. So, you know, one little thing as a leader is get everyone to go around, men and women to go around the room and just give me 20 seconds on what you're proud of having achieved in the last month. It's a great energizer and it gets us all, it gets the women used to talking about what they're proud of achieving using I language, not always we, and it gets everyone just used to women talking about what they're good at. So I would say, uh, understand, you know, find your compass, understand your leadership purpose. It'll fuel your courage. Um, become really intentional and aware, self-aware of what you want and be very generous of spirit around uh, the other women and men in your life and thank them and be very grateful for the foundation of people because you have so many people sometimes just stop and listen who in my life is vested in my success sometimes our focus goes very much to those who are not but actually there are many more people in your life who are vested in your success remind yourself of them thank them and go and ask them for advice wow those are great words to to uh, end up with penny thank you uh, very inspiring, lots to think about, things that I will take with me to bed every night. <laughs> I be more intentional, more grateful, um, and not lose my compass when I finally figure out what my map looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully I'll draw the map earlier in my career. So this is good, good uh, learning for younger people in their careers. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been these. such a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on Women in Payments, Christy. It's been an absolute delight. I'm going to encourage all of our audience to um, share this with their friends and colleagues and to view the other Pause for Payments webinars that we've got in our library. They're all fabulous and very insightful. And we've got some inspirational leaders from around the world speaking about Brilliant. fabulous topics, both careers and uh, industry topics. So thanks very much everybody for joining us today.